There we are. Hello, Lou YouTube. My name is John Kulas. I am a 20-year professor of industrial organizational psychology. I'm a 10-year user of R for statistical applications. And for the last six or seven years, I've been using R to author things, things like academic papers and presentations and technical reports. And so this live stream, which happens every week at uh, 2 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Central on Fridays, this is intended to be a resource for other people who are also interested in authoring. So what I've done is I've assembled a panel of people who are adept at um, problem solving. They're not necessarily, we aren't necessarily all adept at um, authoring with R, um, but we're pretty good at making R do things uh, that maybe it isn't pre-scripted or uh, pre-programmed to do. So. We hope to build this community and have more people participate and um, bring their projects that they're working on, uh, whether that be an academic uh, paper, whether that be a presentation, a website, whatever it is you're trying to produce with uh, R, Quarto, or even Python. We have some Python experts on the panel. Um, hopefully, collectively, we can we can take a look at that and and overcome hurdles when they when they appear because they always seem to do that. We do have a panelist with us uh, immediately, and uh, he's as regular on this panel as, as I am. So let's go ahead and bring him on. Vamos a ver qué es lo que pasa con los alcaldes. Qué es lo que pasa con los alcaldes. Qué es lo que sí. Qué está pasando con los. I don't know, hey, Diego. <laughs> hey, Diego. I I don't know what you think about that about that intro. I might still need to change that. We'll see how this goes. No, I think I'm growing attached to it now. Oh, you are? Okay. So weekly you get this you get to see the Do you understand what the guy is saying? Because I know he's speaking Spanish, but I, I didn't even try to decipher what he's saying. The man oh, I, not the goat. I haven't tried to decipher because it's like in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> oh yeah, it's cut up quite a bit actually. Um let me go ahead and share my screen if I can. Oh, you know what? I didn't even 
knit today's presentation yet, which I should probably do. There we go. Um. There we are. So, um, Diego, just like we've been doing the last couple of weeks, I think what we'll start with is just a recap of uh last week and last week is already session number three for us um and then i've split i've split up what we're going to do i think for the next couple of weeks into two separate tracks because the one that we discussed last week i think is going to be more of a long term we're going to have to work on it uh over the course of weeks maybe you know a month or so four or five six weeks i'm thinking yeah, creating um, the template for for dissertations. I think so, and maybe um, maybe that's a little conservative, uh, so maybe it won't be that bad. But as we're coming into this just completely fresh, I'm guessing that that's going to be uh, kind of a long term solve. So what I did because of that is, and because we don't yet have. Uh, the participation in terms of this live stream chat. We don't yet have people coming in with, hey, how do I do this? Which we hope eventually happens. Um, but since we don't anticipate having much in terms of shared problem solving um, asks, I thought we would add a short term issue each week. And so that short term issue this week um, is kind of related to what we've been doing with the PowerPoint yeah. products in terms of getting images in there. But this is with an academic paper. Um, and it was something that came up this week with a project uh, that I was working on with co-author who I see we have a couple people here now. She might uh, actually be in the chat. So um, let's go ahead and recap what happened last week first. Well, the travel folders all said, welcome to Pottsylvania, but our heroes have had nothing but a bad time since they arrived. First an angry mob, then a dreadful disguise, then a near execution, and now they're on their way to jail. But we haven't done anything. Yeah, we're as innocent as the new mown snow. We're just tourists. <laughs> That's what they all say. Sure enough, our heroes' fellow prisoners were almost all American tourists just like themselves. Boy, this is sure no way to treat your friends. Don't be silly. Pennsylvania got no friends, just enemies. Well, here is your apartment. If you want anything, you can just push that button. But it's not connected. I didn't say anyone would answer. Bye. <laughs> okay. That's some, that can be sometimes like, uh, like, like university professors. <laughs> <laughs> Leave you in jail? <laughs> No, it's like, they'll put on the syllabus. If you have any questions, just send an email. You send them an email and, you know, they never get back to you. <laughs> email is the mode of communication that, so of all the modes of communication in our society, that is the one that best fits one intended population, and that's professors. I, I, I'm old enough. I remember when email first started being a thing in university settings, and, like, I as soon as that came on the scene, that was it. Like that's the only way you could communicate with a professor was email. And it's fantastic because it's so easy. Yeah. It's kind of easy to ignore. And there's that kind of, there's a bit of a barrier there between the person communicating and the person receiving. But yeah, <laughs> that, you know, the, the good, um, the lesson from that Diego is academically I know you're kind of stuck if it's just a single class, but you always need to reach out to five or four or five different people because you're going to get four or five different answers in a university setting. More so with the bureaucratic stuff than the class stuff. But <laughs> that's funny. You, you saw professors in, in that little clip. Um, so last week, what? And last week was a continuation of the previous two weeks. So really, for three weeks, what we were working on was trying to control the placement of images and figures within PowerPoint formatted slides. And so um, placement is fairly straightforward when we're knitting to uh, HTML type slide format, but those commercial slide formats, in this particular case, a Microsoft uh, 
slide format, a PowerPoint format, those are a lot more restrictive. And so really what we wanted to do was to get a little fancy. Oh, I'm not sharing anymore. I'm sorry. I wonder why that happened. This reminds me of teaching when we had to move over to uh, Zoom. I would talk and not realize that I'm not sharing my screen. Um, but we wanted to get a little fancy with our placement of the figures. In this particular case, maybe let's have a wide one on top and then uh, two side by sides underneath that. And Oh, that's what I did. I am. Sorry, still learning the uh, ins and outs of this system here. But this little pop-up, Diego, I, it keeps showing up. And what I'm doing is I'm hitting the big blue stop sharing oh, button instead of the little hide button. So we'll call that user error on the share screen on this. Um, but so we just wanted to get a little... Uh, we wanted to have a little more control over where the figures go with specifically the PowerPoint slide format. We came up with a series of solutions that all have the same flavor. And so that was, well, let's just control the placement of images within an R chunk. And then on that slide, we'll have probably a single image, but that image will be controlled via the R chunks. And so there's a series of... Um, packages that enable that. Well, the, the base R has a built-in function that we didn't fully vet, but it should work the same as these uh, additional packages. And the one that we spent the most time on last week was the grid extra option. And so the code for that, um, what we have here in the code is I have on lines one and two, I have the ggplot package being loaded because all of the plots that we were going to create were going to be nicely formatted, uh, nicely in ggplots. We also use the Palmer Penguins data set because that's kind of the, the in thing to use uh, nowadays, and that's here in line 10. It's funny. We went from uh, Iris, you know, studying flowers and biology and cars, you know, with empty cars. Now we're studying penguins. <laughs> I guess they're, yeah. they're going to they're gonna keep making it more and more goofy. And it's going to get to the point where it's like the emojis data set or. That's a great idea. <laughs> Let's, do that. Let's do an emojis data set. Someone's got to come up with the next one. All it is, is it's got to be, you know, kind of small enough where you can get your he head around it. But I like that. Maybe. Not. Okay. So maybe we'll have two long-term <laughs> problem solves. One will be putting together an emoji data set. <laughs> <laughs> the other will be the LaTeX template. Um, but so we created three different plots here, P1, P2, and P3. And then using the grid extra uh, command of grid arrange, we just called in those three plots, P1, P2, P3. And then the syntactic structure, uh, this R bind on line 12, and it continues on line 13. Uh, the formatting here, when we're showing code through the reveal JS uh, slide deck, the, the formatting in terms of spaces and, and, and tabbing doesn't necessarily transition well. So I, I probably should have tried to tab over that line 13 underneath the rbind command. But really what we have here is we have uh, two columns and two rows. So the first row is saying, give me a 3-3. Three, three. The second row is saying, give me a 1-2. And those numbers refer to the orderings with which you specify your plot objects. So here my expectation is on the first row, I'm going to have my third object spanning two different columns. And that's going to be the penguins. Uh, that's going to be the penguins object. And then underneath that, I'll have the first called out graph, which is P1, which is the flower data. And then secondly, I'll have the second called out object, um, P2 which is actually the cars data. And so if I look at the output, we, we got what we wanted. So we see spanning across both columns, we see the penguins. And uh, then on the bottom left and bottom right, we see the other two uh, less interesting, less colorful uh, slides. And so, yay, we got it. We considered that topic closed. Um, however, if someone 
was interested in doing something more elaborate with PowerPoint slides in terms of producing not necessarily a blob of an image, as this would be on a PowerPoint slide deck, but um, individual images, you know, we, we would reopen that and come back to that and figure out a way to actually do that. For today, um, what I think we'll spend most of the time on are these, uh, are these long term ideas of creating a dissertation template or a thesis template that's specific for um, any one university. And so Diego is currently getting his PhD at Montclair State University and Montclair is fairly new in terms of offering uh, PhDs across disciplines, not just within psychology, uh, but across different disciplines. And so our understanding, and I think the first thing we'll do, Diego, we'll, we'll give ourselves a game plan on this, but I think the first thing we'll do is we'll just double and triple check that there is not an existing LaTeX template at the university that maybe some other disciplines uh, have, have used. But I think what we'd like to do is we'd like to create a template that is uh, that conforms to and is consistent with the formatting requirements of uh, this particular university, Montclair State. And universities are notoriously finicky and picky about formatting of these things. Uh, so again, I think this will be this is definitely a long term problem solve. We're going to be spending Diego, uh, I think, quite a few weeks on this, even if you and I or if other people are interested in participating, even if we do some work uh, between sessions, between Fridays, I think this is still going to be a pretty long-term long -term issue, excuse me. So, I, so one of the things that, because that's going to be more, <laughs> the end product is a long, uh, is a, it's going to be a long time coming. Because of that, I thought we could do these more short-term wins. And so, uh, the first short-term win I thought that we could do is related to an issue that I had this week about getting images into an academic paper. Um, and so I think what I'll do, is I'll just call up R. And I guess I can call up, I'll call up the, the project that that we were working on, and I'll give you a little framing of of what we were trying to actually do. So we have a paper that now has been rejected for submission several several times, but as part of our um, as part of our attempt to get it published, we've uh, decided to call back to some other research papers, and so what we would like to actually do. Let's see if I can find the image. What we'd actually like to do is we would like to um, include in our paper an image that was published in a different paper. Now, this isn't that common in psychology to, to include images as part of your paper. It's a lot more common in, um, it's, it's very common in some disciplines, for instance, biology. When you read biology papers, there's almost always a picture of a petri dish or a picture of cultures. I have a friend that's uh, in the turf sciences, and when they publish, they always have pictures of turf plots, of grass plots. In psychology, it's not that common to have an image, um, but in this particular case, we wanted to add one. And so as I'm speaking here, I'm slowly scrolling and seeing if I can find the image that we wanted to include there it is so let me see this is just a picture that was taken um from a previous article thought it was relevant for our article and so instead of reproducing it we just like to call back to it and so um in biology wasn't there this whole scandal about uh you know people faking results that one of them was that it had an image of like something on the microscope, but they were like uh, blurring it. So they, so not blurring it, but you know, just making the thing they were interested in stand out. Um, just <laughs> sort of like, you know, uh, confirm their alternative hypothesis, even though they didn't, um, you know, they didn't have anything. 
it, it, it became it became the really controversial like a couple of months ago it was done in Harvard I think I didn't see that one in particular but I know academic fraud in general um, is definitely something uh, is something that's probably always existed but it's gained a lot more steam um, recently and psychology certainly we're not uh, immune to that either. Yeah, it's sad. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not a professor anymore, um, but I do, there is a weird form of pressure um, that professors actually have. And I think more so than in other fields, there's a sense of identity that you have when you're in a position like that, when you are a professor. I, I'm not excusing it. Um, I'm just saying that, and I don't necessarily understand it, but, um, but there's a, re there's a reason for it and there's pressure in every job, of course, and you shouldn't do that. It's unethical, but, um, man, that pressure to, to publish it's, it, it can be pretty, can be pretty extreme. Um, especially again, when your identity is tied to that position. So when you, when you see it as a threat to your own person. Yeah. Man, that's that's a lot of stress. Hey, look at this. We got a we got another person coming on just as we're talking ethics. Yeah, I didn't see the clip. What? Like old Pappy used to say, there's a pole cat in the hen house. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. That's weird. It didn't show up for me. Hey, Casey. Hey, hello, Casey. Hello, oh, hello. So, Casey, I don't know if you saw the intro, but we're going to do a short-term thing and then a more longer-term uh, problem yeah. solve, which will be a fun one, which is trying to come up with uh, a, a formatting template that we could use at Montclair for dissertations and theses. Mm -hmm. So the short-term issue is getting an image in an academic paper. And as you see here, the image that I want to put in um, it's cut off and so what and i'm i'm jumping ahead here to the solution a little bit but there's two packages that are helpful with images in things like academic papers uh the first is magic which is great i'm using this image read command through magic to read in the png but then there's a um there's a it's now a base r function um but originally it was its own package called grid and Grid has a function called grid.raster. It's got several functions to control images. And just the default grid raster is actually going to go ahead and, and take a look at where this image is being placed and properly size it so it fits within uh, the constraints of our container within whatever we're trying to actually to. So we'll go ahead and I'll show you um, this, but then we'll try it on a just an empty template file. So just that simple grid raster is really helpful for uh, image sizing. And so if we were to, let's just do a new Papa Jaw file. And Papa Jaw is, um, is the template that the three of us have been using when we author academic, academic -y things. I'm just going to go ahead and save this on my desktop because there's not going to be much to it. Oh, you're playing Jedi Outcast. What was that? You're playing Jedi Outcast. I tried to. You saw that, huh? So I, I tried to, but it doesn't work. I think it's too old. So, um, Oh, what happened here? Got to pull up my desktop. Sorry, I was trying to do too many things at once. Um, you can, 
uh, you actually threw me off there with the uh, Jedi Outcast call out. Maybe I didn't. Did I not save it on my desktop? Oh, I didn't. I saved it within a desktop folder called temp. So we're going to have to look for that. There we go. And it actually produced it not as a PDF. Hmm. Where is this thing? I don't actually see it. That's, I'm going to put it in the current directory so it's a little easier to find. And then we can just get rid of it. Um, get rid of it later. There we go. Um, it was a little odd because I, I wasn't, I was missing my knit button as well. I actually uh, was getting, oh my God, I put it in the wrong. I'm sorry, people. I'm in the wrong project. No wonder we couldn't find it. So here's our uh, APA formatted journal submission. Uh, and if we wanted to add an image to that, we can just find an image. Again, in, uh, in psychology, this isn't very common, but in other disciplines, it's a lot more. Look at that one. It's a lot more common to include images. I don't know. I can't think of a situation where we would include in a psychology journal picture of an kitty with his sticking his tongue out there's there are Diego you're talking about biology and some issues uh with biology there are um there are some stories of very famous authors and and scholars in different disciplines doing things like getting silly with their with their publications so you know hiding the names of their family their kids in there or uh having their pet as a co-author. <laughs> Seeing all kinds of silly things like that. So let's add this image. Let's see if we can first add this image just as a normal image is added um, within Markdown documents. I'm, I don't think I've ever tried this within a Papa Jaw, so I'm not 100% this will work. Normally, you wouldn't want to do this because you would want to um, you would want to recognize this image as a figure within the broader document, uh, which is why we write in chunks. Let's see what happens. It's thinking. Usually when it thinks this long on a small document like that, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Thinking it's going to throw us an error. So while it's thinking, I'm going to go ahead and build the code that we know should actually work with two packages. We'll just use the one first, actually. When I do the analysis for my dissertation, there's you no know, using several machine learning algorithms that usually they take. If you're not, if you're doing too much hyperparameter tuning, it might, if you're not careful, it might take a long, a really long time. So I'm gonna have the dilemma of, you know, is it going, it's taking a long time to to knit because of some error or is it just the algorithm yeah is there any we, way for the console to show you like you know every um uh you know every combination of hyper parameter and the algorithms so, you know to keep track of it you mean as it goes so as it's actually um when you knit when it's when knitting well, I think for you, Diego, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to build source codes, right? So you're going to want to build R scripts 
that you can call out in your RMD. Mm -hmm. But you or can maybe run those. send it to the cache. Yeah, definitely cache those. But then um, you should be able to run them separate too before you knit the entire document. Where's our kitty? I don't see a kitty. Well, let's see if we can actually. Oh, I didn't ask for it. I just called it in. Let's give this a uh, figure caption. Call it nice little kitty. And then it should give us a figure number within the document as long as we on line 83 here call this out. There's a nice little kitty. And then on this one, it doesn't really, it doesn't look like the sizing is as big of an issue, but I think it's probably good practice uh, as you're doing these to go ahead and use that. I think grid has maybe actually been depreciated as a package. As I said, I think it's built in now to base R, but instead of just asking for kitty, we'll use that grid raster command and we'll see if it alters the way our kitty looks here and the expectation is it might blow it up a little bit uh, more consistent with the margins of that paper There we go. And you can control it even more with uh, subcommands within that grid raster uh, option. If we were to knit it as a copy edited journal format, sometimes this blows up, we can try it. Uh, it should actually right size that as well. There we go. In the warning, we, we should, I can disable that warning either in the broader chunk or in this chunk. And again, we're cheating a little bit. We're using our markdown when we want to, uh, moving forward, we want to use Quarto a little more frequently than an R markdown. But so uh, that's a nice little, I think, um, trick to using images and things like academic journals is a combination of magic uh, with that grid raster command. It does a nice job of right sizing things. Okay, so that's our little issue. Now on to the big issue. Um, Let's actually call up our live stream again because I think I had some hyperlinks or live stream slide deck. I think I had some hyperlinks on there that we can kind of collectively think about. So um, in terms of the template for your dissertation, Diego, I found kind of two different approaches. And one is to um, one is to build off of Bookdown, which we've used before. Um, and so the Bookdown-ish solution is to use a package called Thesis Down. <laughs> Have you heard of this? No, just not. I haven't heard of it either. Here's a listing. So I, there's a hyperlink on that on that slide deck. But here's a listing of universities that have actually used this, and where people have gotten their 
theses and dissertations. By the way, I keep saying thesis and dissertation, depending on the part of the world you're in, um, there might be a difference. Here in America, traditionally, the thesis is for a master's and the dissertation is for a PhD. Um, some places refer to a dissertation as a thesis. Um, so we could take this and tweak it to fit in your particular application, Diego uh, Montclair. The thing that I haven't looked into yet and that I'm guessing is that the book down structure requires different RMD files for different chapters. And so I don't know that you want to do that, Diego. I mean, this is up to you in terms of how you want to structure it. But to me, a more useful template would be if you can just create one markdown file and say, here's what I want it formatted like, go. And so I believe that the way that we can do that is through this alternative approach, which is to con which is to create our own CLS file. CLS stands for class. Um, I was really confused when I first saw this as a possible solution because I was reading it as CSL, which we've also used. So CSL is that citation style language, which is relevant for, yeah, it's relevant for bibliographies and, and references, right? And so we use an APA style CSL, CSL file. Um, but with these LaTeX produced um, files, you can also control the formatting through something called a CLS file. And a CLS file, that CLS, my understanding, stands for class. And in LaTeX, there's a couple of different um, ways to specify formatting. One is through a class and one through a style uh, command. And I think what we want is a class command. So Diego, what, what I found here was I found somebody that wrote, I believe it's a him, Tyson, his dissertation by controlling the CLS, the class file. And so he created a file here that's at the top of his YAML that says, read this, and this is the format that I'd like to see this dissertation printed in. Now, to me, this is up to you, because ultimately, you, you know, if Mike shows up, he can weigh in too, because this is going to be relevant for him. Or if you have classmates that want to weigh in, they can do that as well. But what I'm envisioning is this is something that Montclair can take and retain for other people in the future who may want to also publish their dissertations without worrying about the formatting restrictions. Because what this is, is this actually, this takes care of the formatting. And so I think I'm just going to leave those hyperlinks on there. And maybe between this week and next week, Diego, and Casey, if you're interested, if, if, you'd, if you'd like to, and Mike as well, if you guys want to look into these uh, hyperlinks, then maybe we just kind of decide on a path. We either take the book down approach or we write our own class document that can actually, um, that doesn't need a package like Bookdown. And that class document could be used within our markdown, but it could be used, uh, it could actually be used outside of our markdown as well. Um, there's, a, there's another link that I put on here that looked helpful that talks about how to create those CLS files. And what I'm guessing is we should be able to find a CLS file and just modify it to fit Montclair's requirements, right? How many blank pages do we need? How many spaces before your title versus your name versus your committee members? Those sorts of things. That's the formatting uh, that we're going to have to actually kind of spend time thinking about. So Diego, I'm thinking that as a placeholder, we can actually in our in our um, slide deck here. We can talk about next steps. Huh? 
Huh, interesting. So that doesn't... That's another thing we could maybe... Um, that's another thing we could spend some time on one of these weeks if people are interested. Um, as we're learning Quarto, uh, there are quirks in Quarto that, that don't exist in our markdown. One of the quirks is the way in which we render a document. And so you can render it through the R process. You can render it through the uh, Python process or through the Julia process. Um, and because of that, some of the uh, some of the tricks that we used to use in our YAML, for example, putting inline R code in the YAML, uh, are no longer uh, they're no longer as uh, functional. So this Quarto no longer assumes that you're operating within R and you want to actually produce the document using R. And so that's having some it's having some funny issues with uh, the way that we used to script things. One of the way, one of the things that I'm seeing here is the LaTeX specification, the inline code for LaTeX maybe isn't being recognized within the header here. So we'll see. Uh, I guess it was. It's just not showing up in the editor. Okay. So I think Diego and Casey, tell me if you agree or disagree, but I think the very first thing to do is to double and triple check that uh, that Diego's current university does not currently have an existing template to serve this purpose. There's no point in reinventing the wheel. I mean, there is a point because that's kind of what we do on the live stream is problem solving things. But I think the first thing, Diego, and tell me if if you agree or disagree but i think we i think you should spend some time digging around sending out those emails to professors and seeing if there currently exists a template um i think there is um, that's why um i edit it when i send my dissertation to my committee um you know the first pages um i, I had I, so i did it on, on papa job right everything except for the first two posts <laughs> I went on and edited it because um, yeah the, the first page has to be in a certain format like there was a temp not a template but like a, an example that they they sent to me uh, right but, but that example is what we're trying to reproduce so the example that they send you is what they want it to look like right yeah what, what we're talking about is we're talking about um, creating creating a template that produces that, regardless of what you write in your dissertation, regardless of the content. Hmm. So you so typically my understanding is what these templates are referred to within universities is a late tech template. And there's the place that should have it is actually the graduate school. So the first place to check and I can help you with this offline too, Diego. But you want to send an email to the grad school and say, hey, do you have a LaTeX template for dissertations? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or do you know if anyone does have one? Because I think it's possible that some of these other disciplines that have been using this kind of literate programming idea and uh, folding in their code and their analyses with their writing, they might actually have one. So I think you need to check with the hard sciences as well, just random professors or a chair, if you want to email the chair. So I think that includes, I, you guys help me here, but I'm thinking math for sure, computer science, mm -hmm. uh, physics, maybe even astronomy. That's just off the top of my head, but I, I think if the grad school doesn't have a LaTeX template, we also need to reach out to people in these disciplines and see if they use one for the grad school because they may. And now this is only, this is only going to be applicable if they have a graduate program. So if they have a master's or PhD, but I, I think, think that's the, the business point. school might be helpful. 
but I don't know if they will have something in latex. It doesn't hurt. I mean, the more people we talk to, the more likely it is that you're gonna, you know, yeah. that some that somebody knows some legacy person that was using this. Um, okay, so I think we do that, and then the second step is to choose an uh choose our own adventure here in terms of path and i think and maybe if you guys want to do some digging um between this friday and next friday too i think the two different approaches that make sense to me are doing that class specification or we actually use the what was it called thesis down yeah yeah thesis down Um, any other thoughts on that? Oh, look at that. It really came in weirdly formatted. What happened there? We can try to problem solve that. I wonder if it's because I have a period there. Maybe Do you see how that came in? You see how that came in formatted? Yeah. Maybe you need an extra space between one and two. Okay. You know, those doggone spaces. What's it doing? I did two spaces and a hard return, which is a R markdown trick that sometimes works. Maybe try in the visual editor. Huh, it looks fine in the visual editor. Any ideas? I don't usually use numbers. I wonder if it's a numbering thing. Did you see what just happened there? Anyone? Mm -hmm. It actually changed my formatting. Again, that's part of this, like, um, I didn't put these dashes in there. That's part of the Quarto ecosystem that Man, we're going to have to get used to because I do not like that. It's like a ghost. <laughs> it's, it's like these. It's not a friendly ghost. It's not a Casper ghost. I don't know. It's, it's supposed to be friendly. Do you guys even know who Casper is? Yeah. Casper? Oh, yeah. yeah, I would see that movie all the time when I was a kid. Oh, movie. Yeah, you know it is a movie. Uh, I know the I, show and the comic. Which one yeah. are you talking about? Yeah, I'm thinking the comic because there was it was a whole it was a whole group, um, it was a whole group of like paranormal cartoons. So they had Wendy the Witch. It wasn't just Casper. <laughs> it was Wendy the Witch, and then ah, there was something else. And Casper, his foes released three like bumbling ghosts, but they were mean. So they actually wanted the to uncles. haunt people. The what? His in the movie, it's their uncles. His what uncles. The three, the three ghosts are his uncles. Really? Mm hmm. I maybe I ought to watch that movie. Are, are there several of them, or is it just. It's just three. Three? three? That's several. I mean, it's your definition of several. If you think three is seven, I think seven or eight is several. The Casper Cinematic Universe. Right. But you know, I, I only saw the first one and the three bumbling ghosts are his uncles. And the guy from Independence Day is like the, the um, like Dr. Val, what is it? Psycho, no. Um, you know that they they're like the psychology of paranormal stuff. 
parapsychologist? Yeah, parapsychologist. He's he, the guy from Independence Day. Is the parapsychologist? You guys, you guys like measurement, which obviously is called psychometrics, right? But mm -hmm. they, uh, at some point in that parapsychology discipline, they coined the term psychometry. Psychometry, I believe, refers to like telekinesis, like Luke Skywalker oh, yeah. stuff. Like finding yeah. objects with your mind. <laughs> I think so. Psychometry. Yeah. So if this psychometrics thing doesn't work out for you, you can try the psychometry thing. That's <laughs> probably a lot more useful for everyday, everyday thing. <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, I'm ready to kind of call it a week on this one. However, I'm befuddled by what's going on here with uh, the numbering system and how it's throwing off the format, um, throwing off the format of our nicely bulleted list here. So as long as uh, we're here, maybe let's spend a quick second and look at Quarto uh, bullets. I think what um, Posit has done is I think they've tried to salvage a lot of their old help pages. And so when I look for Quarto bullet points, it's bringing me to a markdown basic. And I'm kind of curious to know if this is much different. This looks pretty much the same as markdown. Here's our lists. Uh, hmm. What if we try the ats? Kind of skeptical about at. It's doing the same. I'm, it, it, I think what's happening is it's a mixture of uh, points and numbers, and it doesn't like that. So we might have to actually uh, go with their sub listings like they have here. But this seems, this doesn't seem right because um, why would I need to specify, for example, the number of eyes? Uh, doesn't seem quite right. Nah, it's still messed up. Do you guys use bullet mu bullets much when you're doing um, things like authoring with R? I guess I use them. Well, this is good to know. It's actually auto auto numbering those levels so I can just put in one eye and it's counting two. I use one bullet uh, list uh, in my dissertation. Not sure if you've read it already, but it's um when I'm like defining I'm the out of aspirin. I need I need to go to the drugstore. I'm going to the drugstore after this. And so for some reason I have your dissertation tied to my lack of aspirin. So I'm waiting until I get aspirin <laughs> and then I'm gonna read your dissertation. So Sorry, there's one ahead. part in which I explain, like, you know, basic machine learning concepts like cross validation and um, uh, bagging, uh, you know, all these back propagation. And it's just, uh, it's a bullet point. Uh, I just created bullets. Did, did they give you any hassle? Your bullets? No, no, they're pretty good. They're, it's, <laughs> what, they're well behaving bullets. Yeah, no, no ghost. No. Yeah, so I just use some um, dashes and a tab. Yeah, no, I use dashes too, and those I never had a issue with them. But again, this is this is really my first time in Quarto. Well, this you know, since we started this live stream, that's kind of. In the start of Quarto. 
It really wants these uh, curly brackets at the start of these fences. That's another little, I'm calling it a quirk. It's probably a feature, not a quirk. God, got it, you thing. Why do you do this? What are you doing, thing? Come out of there, you splatter spitting as a trapper! Oh! <laughs> Well, let's spend a little bit of time trying to do this before we drop. I know it's probably frustrating for anyone watching. Um, but let's just try one of these and see. See if it's also coming in odd. And again, we saw if we copied and pasted straight from some of the Quarto uh, help documents, we did see we did see not necessarily helping or not necessarily transferring uh, specifically with the PowerPoint issues that we were working on um, the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to slowly build this, and I'm going to put in I'm going to swap their content for our content. We'll see where where the issue is. So I'm gonna actually put what we want into a notepad file. Casey, any big plans for the New Year's? Mm, I think I'm gonna spend it with my family. Or just my parents. I really don't know. Same here. I forgot about my dad's birthday. birthday it was on the, cause it's on the 27, and it's, not, it's between all these holidays. Oh, so it passed already. Yeah. But I'll, we'll get him something for New Year's. We'll celebrate at the same time. Yeah. The... <laughs> I'm not a dad, but I have gotten older, and so uh, missing birthdays is not, I don't know. I think I might have been it's upset. It's not a big I... deal anymore. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not a big Fencing, deal anymore. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, for some people, might be a consideration that you forgot about it, that you're not reminding them of it. <laughs> Actually, I hate birthdays, so I have one friend, uh, I have one friend that used to, I have, he hasn't done it for a while, but. Uh, he used to, on my birthday, just send me a text and say, hey, just uh, letting you know that I'm not, I'm not saying anything, which, which is perfect. <laughs> okay, so I st I'm, st I'm not sure. The only thing we did different, so we solved it um, by using the help page. Um, oh, we have a comment, Diego. Thanks, Diego, for saying hello. That's our first comment, I think. Uh, so we solved it. The only difference here is uh, using the I specific I close parentheses specification. Just before we drop here, let's try what we wanted to do with the same spacing on line 107, 108. Um, that the help files had. Again, that spacing really messed things up. Hey, looks okay. So it kind of seems like our issue is probably just in simple spacing. But how does this look for homework, you guys? It's mostly on you, Diego, I think. Yeah. If, you, if you can put out a few emails to the grad school and maybe a couple of uh, couple of department chairs, probably math and computer science, at least. Yeah, I'll send them an email asking if there's any lab text template for that they're using for dissertations or thesis. Okay, yeah, that'd be perfect. That'd be great. All right, I think that's it. Um, anything else from you two? We'll meet this Tuesday, last Tuesday, I I cancel because uh, holidays, but 
ne next Tuesday we can meet and go over um, the yeah, let's, paper. Yep, let's do that. I think that sounds good. All right, well, you guys have a good uh, new year. Anyone watching, happy new year to you as well. And remember, every Friday at 2 Eastern, 1 Central, we want to try to build this. We want to get more people in here that are working on projects uh, in terms of trying to create some authoring project using R as a platform. All right. Uh, that being said, and Ian, Ian, by the way, he's in Salvador. Um, oh, God. okay. Yeah, he said he was taking a trip. So that's where he is right now. Yeah. All right. Well, Ian, I hope you're having a good time and eating some good, uh, eating some good El Salvadoran food. More like I don't know what is Salvador drinks and drinks too. What empanadas are those? No, it's pupusas. Pupusas. That's right. Pupusas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, pupusas. hopefully, he's, hopefully he's having some good of those. All right. See you guys. Hopefully in a week. Yeah. See you. Bye. Yeah, bye.